Hey, Ken Hackathorn with my buddy Bill Wilson. We're going to talk about handgun abuse. Both Bill and I, from time to time, see people handling and manipulating firearms in a manner which is kind of distasteful. And I know we just came back from the NRA show. Oh, it was hideous. And standing behind the Wilson Combat booth, and the people were, of course, really enjoying. I mean, there was mobs of people wanting to handle the Wilson 1911s and pistols. And both Bill and I would watch guys take a pistol, well, this beautiful Wilson 1911, lock the slide back, look at it, and then hit the slide release. Oh, uh, we, we watched this all day long. All day long. All day oh. long. And you, you flinch know. because you realize that on a beautifully tuned custom 1911 pistol, that in order to get the trigger pull that everybody loves about a Wilson Combat pistol, those great triggers, mm -hmm. those training three quarter pound triggers that we all, you know, that's what we want so we can shoot well. When you do that, especially on a 1911 design, man, remember it's had the sear nose and particularly the hammer hooks reduced to the point where you've got that perfect contact. Unfortunately, when you drop that slide on the thing dry, it abuses and beats the heck out of that sear notch. As well as the barrel lockup. Absolutely, and people don't understand it. Well, how can that be? Well, as you're kind of about to explain how these pistols work, there's a difference between how they cycle when they're actually feeding and firing live rounds yeah. and when you do it dry. You might explain to them, Bill, a little bit about what goes on with the pistol when that happens. Yeah, when, when the gun's actually being loaded manually or uh, uh, being fired, you know, I mean, you can put a, have the gun at slide lock and put a fresh magazine in it. When it actually feeds that round, the energy it takes to pull that round out of the magazine and push it on into the chamber, up the feeder up and into the chamber, uh, that cushions everything. That's, that's what the gun's designed to do. But when you have it dry like this, no mag in it, whatever, and usually they do a little flippy with it too, you know? That. I mean, all you're doing is damage your trigger mechanism and damage your barrel lockup when you do that and making yourself look like a total and complete amateur yeah. you know that you don't know how to handle firearms so and same you, same thing with revolvers oh i mean boy. ken and i are old revolver deal i mean you see us on tv oh god i just you know i can't stand it when i see somebody do that to a nice colder smith and wesson yeah. or something there's some like guns that. you can say well yeah. but <laughs> it's just it, it's just a it really damages and what happens when you slam the cylinder on a revolver what you do is what they we call you spring the clamp the crane or basically the yoke or crane of your revolver, when it hits, the torque of it will bend it. So pretty soon you end up with a gun that when you d do that a lot, you're going to get the cylinder sideways movement, which means your, your lockup and alignment. Pretty soon you'll say, boy, that thing is spitting lead. Well, no kidding. Uh, my experience in the past is it seems to be more damaging on Smith & Wesson's than about any other brand of revolver. Especially like the in-frame in 357s, which has that super heavy, heavy yeah. cylinder. You but know, like small charge point. holes, so you get yeah. all that weight, and they slam them shut like the detectives do on TV doing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Well, you're going to damage it, and it doesn't take many of those. Oh, no. Not on a, not on a heavy cylinder oh, smell. Oh, man. So when you've got a revolver, you open a cylinder. Do you want you, When it comes time, you just close it like so. Don't give it. It looks cool on the movies when they flick the wrist. And remember, uh, not many actors are gun guys. Yeah. So, and they're prop guns and they don't care. And I'm sure the director said, for effect, flip the cylinder. Well, the bottom line is don't copy that. It's a bad habit. Well, that's, you've covered the revolver. And on the, on the auto, like I said, have a loaded magazine. You get ready to go to the range to shoot. Put your loaded magazine in there. You know, drop the slide with a round, you know, chamber round. Pull yeah. that magazine out, top it off, put it back in, and now you're, you're, you're yeah. good to go. And I tell people, I say, well, what should I do? I've got an empty pistol. I'm going to put the slide down. Well, what you do is simply grab a hold of the slide and let it down like that. Yeah. That's all you need to do. You know, we watch the NRA show. I watch people drop those things and over and over and over. And you know what? By the end of the first day, we had guns where the hammers were following. They'd been, they'd been, you know, the slide had been dropped on empty chambers so many times. Oh, that so it many actually times. Damaged the, the I mean, I stood there. I remember I watched one guy, Kawang, drop the slide. It was a super grade. I watched him do it four times, and I'd flinch every time. And I just, I can't take anymore. And I walked over to him and basically 
hey, how do you like that, sir? You know, what do you think about it? <laughs> and I said, you know, those are really nice guns. One of the reasons they have those great triggers, he said, oh, yeah, it's got a really good trigger. And I said, it won't have for it long if you keep doing that. Yeah. And he didn't understand it. I mean, he, he said, well, what's the difference? He said, I do it all the time in my Glock. I said, well, first off, the Glock has a different mechanism. But still, it's just a it's bad not, practice. It's, it's what you and I would see people who are doing that. It kind of screams amateur. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and it's not good on the Glock either. It's not no. good on It's not good, not on, good any, on any gun. Yeah, because the the it's going to damage the barrel lock up on any model. It's going to paint it. It's going to paint around and, on the lock. And up. I tell people, I had guys say to me, well, with well, GI 45s, we did it all the time. Yeah, and they had six to seven pound trigger pulls and 30 to 35 thousandths of zero engagement. That's why they had those heavy trigger pulls, and you could do that. But when you get a custom pistol, particularly one with a tuned trigger on an 1811, that's a, something it's a, you don't do. You do not drop the slide on an empty chamber. Well, the other thing we see also, especially doing the training and that sort of stuff, is people running metal frame guns oh. with you no know, with lots of carbon built up in them and no lube on them. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's your take, Ken, on making sure you keep the gun lubed? Yeah. I mean, I just tell people, you know, you can really, most modern auto-loading pistols, um, even the metal frame ones, this will say 1911s, Bretas, SIGs, and whatever, if you lube them, and, you know, let's say every 300 rounds, 500 rounds, you put a good quality lube on them, even though they're dirty, they'll run really well. Now, I'm a firm believer, you know, there's a, uh, Todd Green, you know, who passed here a couple of years ago, came up with a thing called the 2,000 round test. And for life of me, I don't understand what the idea is shooting a gun for 2,000 rounds without cleaning and lubing it. Well, I don't know what that proves. Now, polymer frame guns are pretty forgiving by the way they're designed. Metal frame guns, you know, you can make the 2,000 round test if you want to do it. Again, I don't know what it proves, but if you lube the gun every three, four, five hundred rounds, it'll go two thousand rounds. There's not a problem. But I just don't I, I don't get the idea. I see people quote it all the time, well my gun would would or would not pass the two thousand round test. I see this on the internet. Yeah. Who you cares? Know. Who I cares? Mean, <laughs> and people say, well aren't you concerned your gun won't pass nineteen eleven won't pass the two thousand round test? No, you know what? I carry the gun with one magazine and two spares. All I care is it goes bang every time for three magazines. Yeah. You know, I'm, yeah. this 2,000 round thing, when I hear it, I just push the delete button on. I won't say the people who follow that are idiots, but they're getting close. Yeah. It doesn't prove anything. It's stupid. So. Well, you know me, I'm not really big on gun cleaning. Well, yeah. I think most, <laughs> most of us, um, in order to become a gun guy, you shoot a lot. Yeah. Pretty much. And cleaning guns and loading ammo are, are tasks we have to do. We don't enjoy. I don't. Yeah. You know, I have, I have people tell me, well, I, I like reloading. I find it therapeutic. I'm like, oof. Yeah, you need a life. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I will say one thing that people don't realize, though. Cleaning a gun, I think, has two benefits. One is when you clean it periodically, let's say every 500 rounds you clean your gun, you get to inspect what's going on inside. Do you have parts where, do you have part, something that's broke or yeah. something's cracked? To me, it's part of the preventive maintenance to make sure your weapon's properly. And then we talked about another thing as far as that combination of ash and carbon and lube and what that does to the gun, Bill. You might explain to the people about the abrasion. Yeah, it basically just becomes a lapping compound. If you, if you leave enough of that stuff in there, even if you're lubing the gun, you're still not in an optimal situation because of, of that mixture there kind of wants to abrade in the gun. So, I mean, just, I mean, I gotta just mention, I'm not big on, on gun cleaning my personal stuff, I mean, every time we, our, our group shoots about 300 rounds every time we, we have a weekend shoot. And before every one of them, I'll yank the top end off and the barrel out of it. And I'll wipe the carbon off, put some fresh lube on, on the proper locations and go shoot it. And if I, I just don't ever have any, you know, if I have a gun yeah. malfunction, it's, it's ammo related. Ammo related you know, yeah. if, if yeah. something didn't break, it's ammo related. I mean, yeah. it's just, I, I just don't have any issues by doing that regimen. And I don't go to the detail of getting every little bit of, you know, crud out of it. I just make sure I clean the rails, clean the rails off in the barrel lock up areas and put some fresh lube on it and just keep on running. Yeah. So keep that in mind, folks. I mean, you don't need to be obsessive about cleaning, but I think sometimes people over clean. But what I see the most of, and, and Larry Vickers and I have talked about this, everywhere I've been in the world, everywhere, people 
fail to lubricate their weapons. Yeah. And that's the biggest sin. I think part of it is a result of the Glock, because this is a design that doesn't require much lubrication, and everybody thinks that it transfers to every other weapon system, and it does not. I mean, I, you know, same thing. You take like an AR, great weapon, incredibly reliable, but they have to, they don't run dry. They have to, you know, they may go through a magazine or two, fine dry. Boy, once they carbon up, if there's not lubrication in that weapon system, and guys tell me, well, you don't need to lubricate an AK. Let me give you a little clue. Uh, a little lube goes a long way in an AK, but I, again, I can tell you, bone dry AKs are not nearly as reliable as everybody wants you to think they are. Mm -hmm. I've certainly seen enough examples of just the mere fatter. In most places in the world, by the way, guns get cleaned in diesel fuel and they get lubed with motor oil. But it's amazing when you take like an AK and give it a minimum cleaning and lube it down, you know, take the dipstick and put a few drops of oil on the bolt carrier and the bolt head. It's amazing how well they run. Yeah. And now there's another issue we discussed about dropping the slide, about how we still see people from time to time lock the slide back, drop them around in a chamber mm -hmm. and, and drop, then the drop the slide. And as you can explain, that's really hard on extractors. Uh, yeah. that, most handguns are not designed for a true push feed you right. know i mean the round is coming up out of the out of the, the magazine and going into the chamber and like especially 1911 it's, it's designed as a control round feed you know the the rim comes up under the, the extractor hook and then feeds on into the chamber anytime you drop around in the chamber and then just drop the slide on that that extractor hook is having to spring out and snap over that case rim and that's not good on any design, but it's really bad on a 1911. Really bad. But yeah. you know, I've seen a lot of places in the world where guys have a Glocks with the chip broken out of the extractor, mm -hmm. and that's what's going on. They'll lock the slide back, take the first round, throw it in the chamber, whap, yep. and then put a magazine in it. And you know what? Even as tough as these things are, it will chip the extractor. And the 1911, it'll, if it doesn't Snap chip it. the extractor, it will take away the tension. It will yeah. eventually kill the tension you know, the tension on yeah. the extractor, and now you've got extraction issues. Yeah, so, and and one of the things that you guys did on the uh, X9, which is probably, and I know we've talked about it, that was a major project is making that hinge extractor function the way you want it to because the barrel drops down and, mm -hmm. and the amount of grip on the rim. But I think that one of the things about the X9 that people miss that, that was a major coup in the sense that it kind of robbed one of the major weak links in most 1911 design pistols are extractor tension. Let's face mm -hmm. it, that's used to be it was magazines back in the old days. You guys fixed that. The magazine related reliability stuff kind of went away. But the extractors and a lot of vendors use different materials for extractors that are not ideal. Mm -hmm. And like you say, they lose tension. Yeah. Um, I think the hinge extractor for the most cases is a giant step forward. Now I, I will say that, and I think most people in the industry that I know will say that you guys, between the materials and the design and the manufacturing process of the traditional 1911 extractors, you guys have kind of cracked the code on that as far as reliability. Yeah, with modern machines, you know, uh, we can do things now that we couldn't do when that gun was designed. I mean, yeah. we actually machine the the bend in the into extract it. into yeah, the, the extractor is instead. Made into it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the tension is built into it, so it's not bent and want to go back to straight. It's already manufactured with that curve, and then it's heat treated it. so that it's going to stay there. Yeah, yeah. It, wants, it wants to be in that position, not a straight yeah. extractor. Anymore. A lot of manufacturers make extractors, and remember they're heat treated because if you want kind of a spring steel property. Mm -hmm. Then once they get them, they put the tension on them, which means they put a little bend on them. Remember, anything that's heat treated, steel-wise, is always going on when it's stressed, it's want to return to its an original state. Yeah. So that's why you have some guys will buy a 1911 and say, man, it worked great for eight, 900, 1500 rounds, and all of a sudden it quit, extractor quit working properly. Well, guess what? Yeah. It returned to its straight condition, which means it doesn't have any bite, any grip on the case. So the reliability problems show up. Um, and one other thing I find that I consider abuse is I see people shooting ammo in guns that they have no business shooting. For example, if you've got a lightweight handgun and you're shooting some plus P ammo in a revolver, yeah. you're shortening its life dramatically. Yeah. Now, and the same thing, I see guys shooting 
some ammo in auto-loading pistols. Again, let's say it can be a plus P plus nine millimeter round. It's a great cartridge, don't get me wrong, but it will shorten the life of the pistol. I don't care what pistol it is. Well, it's like um, uh, several of the major ammo companies now uh, market NATO ammo. I mean, anytime you're shooting that stuff, compared you're shooting to, plus P. You're, yeah, compared to just regular ball, yeah. you're you're unnecessarily beating your gun and yourself up for nothing. Yeah, and I tell people, look, the NATO spec is well established. Remember, it was designed to make sure that nine millimeter NATO ball would function in a submachine gun, an open bolt submachine mm -hmm. gun, in arty conditions. Yeah, it's why it's over pressure to make that reliability. Because remember, when it gets really cold propellants burn at a lower rate, which means velocity drops. And if you're shooting standard, say American commercial ammo in arty conditions, it's not gonna cycle the guns. Yeah. So this constantly NATO stuff across the board, 5.56, five, 7.62 six, six, NATO, nine millimeter is over pressure by SAMI specs. Yeah. And so you think, oh, I'm not gonna, think I'm ever gonna shoot my pistol is NATO ball, cool, but understand it's kind of like driving your car at red line yeah. RPMs, you know? Yeah. It'll do it, but it won't do it real long. Yeah. yeah. Anything else you can think about, Bill, that we see? Oh, I've got a good one for you. Is I see people abuse magazines terribly. Oh, yeah. From dropping yeah. them on pavement. With, with them fully loaded. And fully loaded, which remember the rounds are gonna bounce down <laughs> and then come back up, which causes the lips to it's, spread. Yeah. Um, I see the other one you've seen too is where if, if you've only got, say, that's a partial magazine, you're doing a mag change and you're dumping a magazine that's got, say, five rounds. you got a Glock mag that's only got five rounds. Well, when you dot, the weight is at the top where the rounds are. Mm -hmm. So it's going to, as it falls, it's probably going to turn and land on the lips. Yeah. Which means now you've got abuse there. Um, and I've seen some loading procedures. I remember I did a, a SWAT class many years ago. And the guys were using 1911 pistols and Wilson Combat mags. And I was watching this one guy. The guy's a big guy. Matter of fact, I think he'd been a college football player. He's a big old boy. And he was talking about, he said, well, I don't like these Wilson mags. They're really hard to load. And I was watching him, and he was putting the rounds in on the top. Snapping them through the... And wasn't sliding them under. He was, And he's talking about, and I said, oh, whoa, 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 what are you doing, brother? And he said, well, I'm loading my mag. And I went, oh, I know why you don't like those magazines because the lips are spreading when you're doing that and you're basically killing the mags. So you kind of, technique's pretty important on how you manipulate a firearm. Oh yeah. Yeah, the thing I see is is when people are doing an emergency reload, you know, for, with the slide open, mm -hmm. you know, they're smacking that thing in there so hard that the rounds are coming up and spreading the feed lips and, yeah. and often tie the gun up when they do that. And well, I mean, when the slides, when the slides back like this, it doesn't take much, no, it doesn't, doesn't take much to seat the magazine, no. you know. And I've seen guys, you've seen this too, where guns that slide lock, I mean, they're basically the guns that slide lock, bam, they fire, they bring it out, they dump the old, they put the fresh one in and then they think they gotta get an extra wrap. Yeah. Another wham yeah. to make sure it lasts. Well, what happens, Sometimes the top round of the magazine will actually pop up. Yeah. So when you try to feed it, now you got yeah. a stoppage. Yeah. They've taken an empty gun and created a, basically a malfunction clearance drill. So remember, just to seat it nice and smooth. Um, one of the advantages to later pistol designs, one of the drawbacks to John Browning's 1911 is he designed it so that the magazine, in essence, was flush with the bottom of the frame. Yeah. And we've learned that a little extra base plate or pad when you come to the process of seating the magazine, actually makes it a more sure job of, or more likely to have it latched into place. So, and by the way, your magazines and most of the 1911 magazines all now have some kind of extended base plate, which helps fix that problem. Yeah. So, yeah, I think kind of an overview, folks, of things you want to be conscious about. You know, these are life saving tools, and you don't want to abuse them. Thank you, Ken. Okay, listen. Wilson Combat YouTube channel. Be sure and subscribe. Lots of good info coming your way. And the gun guys will try to do our best to keep that stuff coming to you. Stay safe. Take care.